Due to the global outbreak of the coronavirus, the Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees, so our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We appreciate your staying with us on Straight Talk Africa. Joining us today to talk about the upcoming elections in Malawi is Janet Zenat Karim, a former diplomat with the permanent mission of the Republic of Malawi in New York, and reporter Elderson Chagala, who is based in Blantyre, the Malawian commercial capital. I have to say that uh, Janet and Elderson, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, Shaka. It's been an honor as well. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you, Shaka. It's You're... great to be here with you, and thank you for having us here. You're most welcome, and uh, I have to assure you that uh, the feeling is mutual. Now, Elderson, let's come to you since you have the vantage point of being on the ground. Walk us through the developments on the ground, especially in view of the fact that uh, the chairperson of the Malawian Electoral Commission, Dr. Jane Ansa, is history. She tendered her resignation. Has it been accepted? Thank you very much, Shaka, for having me on this show. Um, yes, indeed. It's now history that we have Jane Ansa resigned as the chairperson for the Malawi Electoral Commission. It came to many as a shock, considering that the number of demonstrations that were organized, for example, last year, asking for her to go could not yield anything. But now with the Supreme Court of Appeal, uh, agreeing with the lower court, the high court, annulling the last year's presidential elections, she just had to say goodbye. What happened is that uh, she just had to accept and seriously take leave of her office. In the meantime, what we are uh, experiencing is now that gap, uh, that vacuum that has been created because in under 20 plus days, we are supposed to go to the polls. As such, her leaving was expected by many. However, it came as a shock because she left quite late as uh, rather than um, other than leaving area than was expected. So yes, Jane Asa uh, um, is now history. We are expecting to have another chairperson for the Malawi Electoral Commission. What about uh, some sources which are saying that uh, you are probably experiencing uh, a sort of constitutional crisis? So it is a situation uh, we are saying it's a constitutional crisis because nobody knows which direction we are taking now. Why? We don't know until today when exactly Malawi is going to the polls, which is the date that Malawi is going to the polls. At the same time, it's now like there's power, you know, power hungry from either of the constitutional, constitutional you know, bodies. Uh, the parliament says, no, we still have a say. The courts have said, you have to go to the polls. And then you find that the attorney general comes in and says, no, there's nobody who can set a date save for the Malawi uh, National Assembly. So is that crisis which needs just to be handled with care. So let me ask you this question again. So what is the mood like on the ground? Malawians are very enthusiastic and very optimistic to go to the polls and cast their vote, choosing their president of their choice. Now that we don't have a president uh, until we have a new one. So on the ground, a lot of things are happening. Politicians are going out full throttle campaigning and people are thronging their islands, trying to hear the issues and promises that may help them choose the right president. At the same time, there is the COVID, which is also a scare to many, but in many people are paying a blind eye to the COVID-19 and they are thronging these rallies, regardless of the threats that it comes with. 
Wait a minute, uh, Edison. How can you possibly say that uh, you do not have a president until you get a new one? You obviously have an incumbent president until another one or until some other president is elected, isn't it? The Supreme Court, if we are to go into the ruling of the Supreme Court, uh, the president we have now is the caretaker president because there were no elections after the five-year mandate of the, the president that was voted into power. So for now, we have a president who is taking care of the situation until we have the new president who will be sworn in, whether it's him or somebody else. I see. Uh, Janet, what is your immediate reaction to the resignation of who I figure, or rather who I understand, in fact, uh, at one time happened to be your uh, classmate at college? that you actually used to breathe the same air. Dr. Jane Answer. Well, I would like to commend my friend Jane Answer for the decision that she has taken. It, the writing has been on the wall for a very long time, and she, as a very learned person, uh, 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 a doctor, she's the first doctorate of law in our country. So she has studied the law now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is she actually, did she in fact become the first doctor of laws before the incumbent president, Professor well, Mutarika, me, me who actually to... earned the equivalent of uh, a PhD in law at Yale back in 1964? I'm talking about the locally trained Malawian lawyers. I see, all right? I see. Those that have been in the country, because... Uh, you know, let's face it, Professor Mutarika came into the country in the, I think in the, I don't know when, the 1990s. 1995 was when we first saw him. Uh, he was the chairperson of the constitutional co uh, conference that we had in Malawi. That's the irony of it all, that we're having all these constitutional problems under a president, under the leadership of a person that was the chairperson of the very brilliant constitution that we have. But to answer your question, Dr. Ansa should have resigned long ago, but she was saying she did not, she said that she did not want to resign as a result of the demonstrations. But the demonstrations were backed by the Constitution, of which she and I were delegates at that Constitution conference. We were there and we, we ensured that the elements of the Constitution that have gone and that are actually being used now against this president and against Dr. Ansa. We were all delegates at that uh, constitutional conference. And those elements are there, and the judiciary is acting on the elements that we put in, we, Malawians, put into our constitution. Now, Erdogan, uh, given that uh, Dr. Ansa has stepped down, uh, perhaps due to some of the uh, demonstrations organized by the opposition, talk to me about who actually, in your view, you think has the momentum? Who has the momentum? Is it the opposition or is it the incumbent president, Professor Mutarika? A big question, a very difficult question. However, I would say that Malawi needs to move forward. Whoever is planning to become the president of the republic surely must also look at how our constitution should be modeled. Uh, it's a situation where the opposition and the ruling parties are all like Mouth Agape and Hans Akimbo saying, where are we going next? Everybody is like shocked at, as to how events are, are, are happening in Malawi. We still don't have a date today. We thought June 23 is going to be a day when we're going to the polls. But alas, here we come again. Somebody just says, no, it's going to be parliament sitting and deciding on the day. So the, the going out of Jane and Sa is another gap that has to be created. At the same time, we still need to know a day and date when we're going to go for the votes. Because the more we, we wait, the more anger people do not necessarily understand what is happening. Because what we all know now is we're supposed to go to the go to the to the polls and vote. And if the dates keep changing, people think that somebody is trying to play games. So, Jane Ansa is gone. The new chairperson is supposed to come in. However, they're going to select him or appoint him.
but time is of essence. Malawians want just to go and vote and have a president. What do you think is the driver behind these elections? Is, it elec is, is this election driven by the issues or is it driven by personalities as some have suggested? There have been promises and people would like to see those promises fulfilled. One year has passed, nothing really to show. So Malawians are desperate. We are poor, a poor nation, and nobody wants to be called poor. And with the promises that come with politicians, Malawians now, they are looking at the long-term problem that poly politics has brought. And politics itself is supposed to, to change. So what is at, at stake now is, we want that which was promised to us, whether by the opposition or the ruling party, but time is running out. So Malawians now knowing that last year's uh, elections were now, now they just want to say, when are we having our next president? And they are actually eager to go and cast their vote, to find the president who will give them what they, they desire. Janet, what about you? Are these elections about the issues or are they about personalities? They're about issues. Let me just uh, point one thing, or two, I want to point about two things. First of all, while the campaign is going on, the Tonse Alliance, which is made up of nine uh, opposition parties, uh, the, the chief amongst them being the UTM and the uh, Malawi Congress Party. They're going out, all the leaders are going out, including Dr. Chakwera, Dr. Chilima, they're going out, Dr. Joyce Banda, they're going out and campaigning. On the, uh, you know, the current government side with uh, Professor Mutarika, while his leaders, you know, other people in the party are going out on the campaign trail, Professor Mutarika himself has not come out to do any campaigning. So that's one problem that is going to be there for the, um, a, what is it, uh, the DPP UDF uh, political side, okay? Their, their leader is not there. Only, you know, the, the vice presidential uh, nominee is there. Pres Professor Mutarika, had, President Mutarika has not been coming out to do any campaign. As far as uh, the issues are concerned, let me point out to you, uh, Shaka, that we had um, the, the ninth uh, pastoral letter that was issued by the Catholic Church. And it had a seven-point issue agenda that, you know, they, they spoke to. Poverty, um, health, education, uh, the environment, COVID-19. They addressed these issues, corruption uh, in high places, and um, the, the vacuum, leadership vacuum uh, being there. And they addressed these issues. And if the, you know, the, the leaders that are campaigning, you know, for, you know, to be our next president. They will take these issues. And I must say, so far, even the Tonsi Alliance, they have been talking about the issues. One of the things that uh, um, has been brought up again and again is the cost of fertilizer. Why is that an important issue? That is an important issue because Malawi does not have gold mines. Malawi does not have diamonds. We had some uraniums. I don't know what happened to it, but... We don't have the uraniums anymore. But Malawi is predominantly an agricultural country. And if you put a, a bag of fertilizer at $25,000, when someone earns $15 a month, that's really, you know, cutting people in the feet. And they cannot do that. And that's why we have so many petty traders or people from the rural areas rushing to the cities because they need find uh, a livelihood. They need to make money in order to survive, for their families to survive. So by reducing the cost of a bag of fertilizer to $4,000, that puts it in reach of, uh, you know, the, the Malawians, the majority of Malawians who are peasant farmers. I see. Erdson, uh, when you talk about uh, the incumbent president, uh, Professor Mutarika. You're talking about a man who obviously has already gone through his first term. What would you say has been his single most important decision for Malawi? And what about uh, the single most regrettable decision that he has made during that period? 
Shaka Sali, um, I will tell you that uh, President uh, Peter Matarika is viewed as the, as the professor of law. At the same time, as the leader of Malawi, what I can see is that um, he, to an extent, tried to fulfill what was started by his uh, brother, being Wamtarika. But one thing that I would single out is the introduction of uh, technical colleges across Malawi in almost all 193 constituencies, where he is trying to build um, and put up structure for technical colleges. Technical colleges to enable those uh, young Malawians in the rural setting to access uh, technical skills. That is one. However, while on the same, I would love to see that functioning because structures are one, but to manage them and having everything in order is another. The second thing is, if Mutarika was to revive Malawi, for example, because what I'll tell you now is like the Malawi government is dependent on taxes. And a country that is relying on taxes alone, I don't think will achieve most of what development means. For me, like the Kamuz, in the Kamuzu era, where we had government having some private properties, like the sugar company, uh, the, the leather company, cloth making companies, those companies were making money the, pro the profits were taken back into the government coffers in, in account number one, and it was taken back to the society where you have drugs in the hospitals, maybe schools were built and other things. But now relying on taxes alone, as I see even the other coming governments, if they are going to remain the same, I think the poverty will be our best friend who is also the biggest beast that will kill us all. So I'm looking at a situation where if only these were revamped, I think I would be talking of a different story. But if the same is going to remain the same, even if we have an angel coming from heaven, Malawi will still remain a poor country. Why? There are so many things that are supposed to be done. For example, the road infrastructure. Yes, Peter Mutarika is trying to bring them back, but these are the roads that were built then. The kind of people that are being brought to do the same are now the ones that are being called corrupt people. So you would see that situations have been positive and at times negative. He's a president who, for me, as a journalist, would say, thank you, Mr. President. At least not us as journalists have been imprisoned, okay? We've been given the, the freedom to publish everything we want, provided we have the evidence, and nobody has been arrested. But talking of governance, issues of corruption, tribalism, and others, it's what people have been saying, why can't this be looked at and stopped? as soon as it can. So we have a president here who, if given another mandate, must look at all these things. But if not, then I think the coming president should seriously look at these issues. If Malawi is to be called the home heart, not just the home heart for people who come to Malawi and we smile at them and show our happiness in our rags, but the warm heart in all spheres of life. What about you, uh, Jeanette? Uh, how would you uh, respond to the same question that I posed to Erdogan, and I'm talking about uh, what would you say, in your view, that uh, is the single most important decision that uh, Professor Peter Mutarika has made during his presidency, and what about the single most regrettable decision during the same period? Well, I'd like to concur with um, Edison on what Edison had said, so I'm really not bringing anything new to the uh, conversation. However, I would just like to add that in uh, what uh, Edison was talking about, that uh, before when we had Dr. Banda ruling the, uh, the country, government owned a lot of, uh, of um, companies, and when we say they owned it, they had shares in a lot of companies. We take, for example, the cloth making um, industry. You start it from the seed that is cotton growers. You give seed to the cotton growers and they grow the cotton. Then the government goes and, you know, the uh, company goes and gets it and then uh, changes it into, uh, into cotton and then make, makes a cloth out of it. The tailors come and buy it and, you know, sew the beautiful shirt that you're wearing, Shaka, with cloth made in Malawi. That was wonderful. Yeah. But now, 
come in uh, the government of Dr. Muzi in Democ Democ Democratic Malawi, and we had the, what we call the privatization uh, commission and privatization program. This is the beast that has killed, uh, you know, Malawi and rendered Malawi into, you know, into to spiral into further poverty, because with the closing of the industries, it meant people did not have a livelihood. The cotton industry, it, it you know, you kill the cotton industry, you're killing it from the farmer. So the farmer, the cotton, you know, the cotton fields are no longer there because even if they grow the, you know, the cottons, who's going to buy it? Because the David Whitehead and Sons, the, the government owned shares in, was sold to somebody, and that somebody thought, I mean, saw that he was making more money if he brought in secondhand clothing. So Malawians are wearing secondhand clothing when, in you know, during Dr. Banda's days, we were wearing clothes that were made from a seed that was grown in Malawi cotton that was, um, uh, you know, made in, in Malawi, it cloth that was made in Malawi, tailored in, in Malawi by the Conde tailors. Even the Conde tailors, they're no longer there because no one is bringing them cloth to, to sew for them. And you've, you've killed several, you know, livelihoods, several industries in one go by selling uh, uh, a company like David and Whited and Sons. We used to make buses. In, Mal in Malawi, we used to make uh, plastic bags in Malawi. We used to make window 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 panes in Malawi. We used to make you know paint. Right now, you know, if you you want to buy a, a, a tin of paint in Malawi, you probably can't afford it because it's too too expensive. Because as Edson said, the tax, the tax on it, the you know the overheads on it are just too high. You better you'd rather better you know buy a, a bag of uh, a, 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 a tin of uh, paint from outside the country. And that is the things that has killed Malawi and continues to kill Malawi. We need to bring government-owned industries and companies. We need to bring government uh, projects in the country. We cannot subcontract or outsource the building of a national road to somebody that just got in the business because they, they support the party. They have no idea. There are no engineers in that company, and yet because they clap hands as the president is uh, passing by, when their project proposal is put in front of decision makers, they take that one. Or they're, you know, they, they're leaned upon to, to make a decision towards that person. This is the corruption that was brought out in the uh, pastoral letter that we can't just be giving each other uh, um, uh, contracts, assigning each other contracts just because they're our friends or they're our relatives or they come from our uh, tribes or, you know, regions. So we, the corruption in the country has grown really, really to alarming levels. And, and it, it's actually deplorable, quite deplorable, that a lawyer, a man of the law can sit there and be next to ministers in his cabinet that have been charged, they're blurring headlines on the front page, and he's having a cabinet meeting with them, and everything is okay. But that's, you know, that that's called, you know, that is, he's grown alligator skin, and it, it's terrible. He, he, there's nothing that can, you know, change him, there's nothing that can move him, and if there, there's nothing that can move him, the elections should. And the elections did, but because of uh, the fraud that was there, which the Constitutional Court said there was fraud, then they have to go. We have to have new elections. They nullified those elections, and it was endorsed and um, uh, upheld by the, uh, the Supreme Court. And that is the highest you can go. You can't go any higher than the Supreme Court of Malawi. And we have a constitution that has divided our uh, governance in three structures. The executive, headed by the president, the legislature, headed by a, a speaker, and the judiciary, headed by a chief justice. And those have got, you know, equal parts, and they've got their roles that they play. And, the chief, you know, the judiciary, headed by the chief justice, said the elections are annulled. We're going to have, the, you know, we're going to have new presidential elections, and those things have to happen. They better happen. I was wondering um, how important is the system of checks and balances in Malawi in view of the fact that uh, the Malawian judiciary has demonstrated 
its fierce political independence, given that it was able to find courage to overturn or to honor an election won by an incumbent president, Professor Peter Mutarika. Shaka, what the Malawi courts have done is a rekindle, rather, I would say, or I would say it's, it's, it's brought back uh, the trust, the confidence, and the, 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 the desire that Malawian staff has had uh, as regards the, the, the bodies that are mandated to provide the, the checks and balances. For example, the Malawi uh, judicial system, it has shown the world, for example, and Africa at large, that despite of anything, you still can perform and transact your business by just following what is on the ground, what has been presented to you, and by following the statutes that are laid down. We never gave it a chance that maybe the Malawi courts would annul at least these past elections. Between you and me, um, I would say what has been demonstrated is the beginning of what the Malawi institutions that are governed or that are, are, are public are supposed to show. We have the anti Bureau, the Ombudsman, the Office of all these bodies must learn from what the judicial, uh, uh, the our judiciary has, has, has just demonstrated. There were issues you may have, you may, you may have heard that the judiciary were enticed with money just to, to 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 help the other party or the other politicians to win or uh, kick out this particular case. But then the judiciary was strong, and here it is from the High Court, the Supreme Court ruled independent of any other uh, incentive. So that alone gives hope to Malawians, who will eventually, in this case, go and vote, knowing that the truth will always out. And our judicial system, for example, and others will start from there being honest and transact their business accordingly. These are public offices that needs public trust. And the, what we are seeing now is a Malawi where even fear will not be there if you have the truth before you. So yes, Malawi is now awake. Malawians have trust. Malawians have hope that even these forthcoming presidential elections will be valid, will be credible. Because amongst others, Shaka, you will learn that in the Supreme Court ruling, they actually said, lucky you, the commissioners, who, in quote and quotes, missed these past elections because the Malawi Electoral Commission will pay for you. But come these forthcoming elections and going forward, no one will pay for you, for your sins, for your crime. You will pocket, you will pay from your own pockets. So that also sets an example as to how we should work, transact, and deal with public offices. As I often say, time is not our best ally. We'll go for a break, and when we come back, we shall continue with the discussion. So please, don't go away. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. Every week, connect with our experts. You can ask them your questions and get their advice. Join me, Lina Hamoudou, in Washington on Healthy Living, your new health program right here on Voice of America. Welcome back to the special edition of Straight Talk Africa. Our distinguished guests are Janet Karim and Edson Chagala, and our discussion is the upcoming election in Malawi. Perhaps the only other country on the African continent that pretty much took uh, uh, the same, uh, uh, made the same decision, courtesy of the Supreme Court of its country, besides Malawi, was Kenya, the Republic of Kenya. And it is also interesting that uh, the two founding presidents, the one of Malawi, Dr. Hastings Kamuzu Banda, and the one of Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta, Muse Jomo Kenyatta, were both students for many, many years in Europe and eventually led their countries to political independence. How important is the upcoming election, really? Shaka, the upcoming elections are very crucial 
uh, because now it's the decision of the youthful malaria who wants to see that which was promised. Uh, you're looking at Peter Mutarika, who has the root for the five years, and now what is on the ground? Do, do they get what they really were promised? If not, if you give it another mandate to rule for the next five more years, will he accomplish what he promised to give Malawians? Again, you are looking at the new youths coming on the uh, on the on the political arena. Uh, you are looking at uh, uh, Chilima, the, the vice president, who has now gone into the opposition, trying to align himself with the the major political party, uh, the Malay Congress Party, and the other parties forming a, a formidable alliance saying, you know, I have the stamina to take Malawi together with the, my colleagues to some higher level. So the youth are always like, you know, expecting something better than what they've been given so far. So we are looking at the Malawi, uh, the fresh elections coming with a lot of promises. And again, trying to see what has been laid on the ground. Is it that which we wanted there or indeed these people can bring what they promised? when voted back into power. Now, let me come to you, uh, Jeanette. Uh, there are some Malawian observers who have said that since independence, when Nyasaland regained its political independence from Britain in the 60s in the, under the name of the Republic of Malawi, uh, that that was the first time that you had a very important election. And that the next time you had an important election, in their view, not mine, was in 1994, when a one Bakiri Muluzi was able to defeat the leader of the Malawi Congress Party, a man that was essentially revered, and some looked at him as a political or a presidential monarch of sorts. Not only was he Dr. Hastings Kabuzu Banda, the president of Malawi, but he was, among other things, known as the Yamuyaya, the Nguazi. That was, in the view of Malawian political observers, another very important election. How would you say, for example, that the upcoming election is the kind of important election that pretty much, pretty much may in fact be on the same page as the other two elections that observers mentioned. Thank you very much for that question, because I was there in 1993, and I'm still here in, in uh, 2020. The election in 1994 took place, you know, it took Malawians 25 years to say, uh -uh, enough is enough. This is too much. Yes, they had seen a lot of developments. And I must uh, tell you, uh, Shaka, that in the 25 years that Dr. Banda was uh, president, all the developments that you see in Malawi were there, you know, during the time that they were made during the time Dr. Banda was uh, uh, president. And I minus from there the parliamentary building in Milonga, which was built by uh, during the time of uh, Bingu Montarika, uh, and then the um, the, what, the mausoleum that houses the the remains of our former president. Other than that, there has been no developments, major developments that have taken place in, in the 25 years since we gained our independence. What we credit Muluzi with is dim, dim, dismantling our industrial in the country. What we can credit uh, Bingo with is a growing um, tokenism that if you go to the DPP, if you support the DPP, and young boys started painting their bodies with blue paint. And I I cry for them because they don't know what, what is in that blue paint, what is that in the blue paint. It could be a danger to their bodies, we don't know. But they started, they, they, it was the start of tokenism that has, you know, the country has not been able to dismantle and a growing corruption. And it reached a crescendo and actually 
is during Dr. Joyce Banner's uh, term in office, two-year term in office, when she and her uh, officials came in uh, to know that the you know civil servants were bleeding money out of the government system, and this is called the cash gate. Okay, she heard about it. She 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 noted it, and she brought in investigators. And I credit that to her. But unfortunately, she was then hounded by Mutarika for two years. The majority of Mutarika's first term was hounding Joyce Banda and looking for her so that he could imprison her. When in actual fact, now the international courts have said no, she had nothing to do with that uh, the, the, uh, the corruption that was going on. But during his now, you know, during also his office, this continued. The, you know, the, uh, the government fraud, these persons in high office, there was the Mace Gate scandal, which, you know, miraculously, the, the minister that was um, guilty of, of that, or, or being in charge of that, was declared not guilty. Are you, talking about, so are, you talking about, are you talking about the Cash Gate scandal? I'm talking about, there's a Cash Gate scandal? And then there's a maize gate scandal. I see, maize I gate see. scandal is we had a famine, we had a famine in Malawi, and he, a minister, Chaponda, went to Zambia and negotiated a price. And when he came back to say that, oh, I've I've gotten this um, great powerful deal with Zambia, maize that was costing five, let's give an example, five thousand Malawi kwacha, was landing in Malawi at twelve thousand kwacha. So that, you know, in a, in a country that has got famine, and I, I only told you, let's say the, um, the minimum wage is 15,000 kwacha. So you have to buy a bag of maize for 12,000 kwacha. How are you going to survive the rest of the, the month when you, when you subtract that on 3,000 kwacha? It, it's, um, it's a sad situation. At the same time, we're also seeing that in the time of COVID, ministers are, pocket, are pocketing uh, 450,000 Malawi kwacha when a health official in COVID, working on COVID, is pocketing 60,000 kwacha per month. And yet a minister is pocketing 450,000 kwacha per day just to sit at a, around, a round table to talk about the briefing, to give you figures. I can give you the figures uh, of the COVID-19. I don't need to sit at a table, uh, in, you know, at Capitol Hill and, and then pocket I can give you those figures. Thank you. I can give them to you for free. But <laughs> ministers are pocketing monies. And that is corruption that is being seen. It's it's on in the newspapers every day. And the next thing we're going to see, uh, although Chagara said that uh, the, the journalists have not been in prison yet, they haven't been pr in prison, but they haven't been listened to either. Because these news items are appearing every day, blurring um, headlines. Headline after headline after headline after headline. And thank God we've also got private televisions in Malawi. It's not only private radio stations, but we also got private uh, televisions. And this is what is giving fuel to Malawians because they're going around following the opposition leaders where they're campaigning and they're able to bring the news to Malawians as it is happening. Well, that of course makes Elderson's point that, that yes. uh, at least the incumbent the president, president has not undermined uh, your freedom of the press or freedom of expression. Let me come to you, uh, Elderson. What about you? How important is this upcoming election? As important uh, as, according to some Malawian observers, the election in 1994 when Bakiri Muluzi will go through essentially defeated the Malawian founding president, Dr. Hastings Kamuzubanda, the man that uh, was considered to be the Yamuyaya, the Nguazi of Malawi, the man that, in fact, political pundits regarded as uh, a political presidential monarch. Correct. If we are to weigh the two extremes, you will discover, Shaka, that uh, Malawians were tired of the one-party regime uh, because, you know, there comes a time when you you are empty of your ideas. You kind of, like, repeat the very same things that you, you had. That When you reach that, that moment, 
it's like there is no progress. So Malawians were like, okay, fine, we have had Kamuzu for up this long. And the, with the atrocities that were being committed then, then they felt like, no, time to change has come. Let's have the freedom. Let's have the, the, the rights, our rights respected. So they ousted Kamuzu Banda. We brought in democracy. And that was the beginning of the multi party kind of regime in Malawi. At first, Bakiri Muluzi brought the freedoms. Everybody could do stuff. Every, everybody was able to do what was then uh, deemed as a taboo or indeed you no know, goes on or what you can't say, you can't do this, women can't do that. But then that freedom was, the, was, a, was a freedom that had no limitation, kind of. It brought in so many things, Shata. Corruption, mm -hmm. tribalism was rampant. Everybody was doing, it was more or less like free for all kind of democracy, you know. So, Bakiri Mulus did his part. But then, people started questioning what this democracy was all about. Was it about freedoms without responsibility? Yes, rights are there, but can we just let everything be done without checks and balances? Then we saw the regime of Dr. Uh, Bingwa Mutalika, he saw rest in peace. He came... And then he started building structures and he started putting things together. That was seen as a punishment again. People were like, he's trying to behave and act like Kamuz. But you see, Africans, just like everybody else elsewhere, they need some guidance. They need some whips, not whipping that you are punishing someone, but a whip that will correct things. So Bingo Mutarika came in and tried to correct the mistakes that were made during the Muluzi era. And that was seen as negative to an extent, but later on, it was seen as a corrective kind of no, uh, a strategy. Sadly, he died when he was in the office. Joyce Banda came. He did he, her part. She did her part. Uh, she helped a lot. She did her part. Within two years, we could see some new things coming in, uh, trying to sort one problem and another. Came uh, uh, this current president now. Uh, he's kind of like trying to build where his brother left. But how this is done... It's, a, it's kind of like he's left it more to people, like those in public offices, to do their way, much as maybe things would be reported to him by us, for example, reporters. Some action would take longer to be implemented. So that has been kind of like a negative area where people would say, uh, Peter Mutarika is a very good man, but no, his presidency is questionable because he does not necessarily push like his brother was. He was not, he's not able to argue and maybe critique and put things straight and quickly in order. So that has been his you know, negative side of life. But uh, to a large extent, I think we have had our own experiences. We believe the coming in president, if another new one is coming, would look at correcting things putting everything just like we do at our respective homes. And if Peter Mutarika is to come in, Shaka, he must really now look at what did I go, where, where did I go wrong, and how can I change for the change to be effective. Janet, talk to me about uh, the man that um, inherited the mantle of leadership in as far as uh, the Malawian founding uh, party is concerned. I am talking about uh, Mr. Chakwera, a man who leads the Malawi Congress Party, and indeed the man that um, is leading the Grand Coalition. What makes him tick? Walk us through the kind of qualities, the kind of uh, competence that you think Mr. Chakwera has. What is his vision, for example, for Malawi? Does he have any particular vision for Malawi? What makes him tick, really? I must again come and own up. <laughs> Dr. Kwera, uh, Dr. Jane Ansa and I were in the same class at Chancellor College. So uh, let me put that in front of everybody before I, I go on. But Dr. Chakwera is a man of integrity. integrity. He is honest. And he is the perfect servant leader. I'm glad uh, my colleague Elson brought up the uh, the issue of the teaching of Jesus that he came here taught about he he, 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 he was for education, agriculture as well as the health of people. 
Dr. Chakwera was the leader of the Assemblies of God, General Secretary of the Assemblies of God Church uh, in Lilongwe, that, and the General Secretary of the whole Malawian uh, Assemblies of God Churches. So he's a man of integrity, he's honest, and he is a servant leader. And he, to me, has, having joined the Malawi Congress Party, what did the Malawi Congress Party stand for? I told you already, Malawi does not have any mineral minerals or any, you know, resources of that nature. We own, our only mineral that we have, our only natural resource that we have is the land. So the backbone, the mainstay of Malawi is agriculture. We have sugar plantations in Malawi. We've got tobacco plantations in Malawi. We've got um, corn, uh, maize uh, in Malawi. And what is important in, in Malawi is making sure that Malawians have got food security at the household level. And by reducing the uh, cost of fertilizer, that shows that Dr. Chakwera's first and foremost uh, program or plan on his uh, ticket is to ensure that every Malawian goes to bed eating three meals a day. The, there's a cliche that is going around there right now that if you eat if you eat one day one meal a day it should be by choice not because that's all you have and to me that that speaks to you know to many Malawians it appeals to many Malawians that they're going to ensure this is a party that is going to ensure that you have three meals a day so you have food on your table there's education education has been a problem in Malawi for many many years many years. It started uh, plunging and it has continued to plunge. 25 years, we, we speak about education in Malawi, but we really have not taken it seriously, as Edson pointed out before. What, is what has been important is who do you support? How much do you support? And when they say jump, how high do you jump? And that, that's a problem. That doesn't, you know, get you, you know, to your next stage in, in life. It may get you a meal today, but it doesn't secure a meal for you the next day. So Dr. Chakwera is a person that wants to build Malawians, first of all, unite them, and build the nation, that we are a united nation. It doesn't mean that we are one party. No, that's not what he's speaking about. It means we are one nation, Malawians, and not, you know, maybe I am more Malawian because I come from the party where the president comes from. No, but we are all Malawians, whether you're a Tumbuka, you're a Tonga, you're a Chewa, you're a Sena, you're a Lomwe, you're a Nyanja. We are all Malawians. Oh, let me just mention my, 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 my tribe. You're Angoni. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We are all Malawians. So we're building one Malawi, not, you know, several segments, uh, fragments of Malawi all over the place. So Dr. Chakwera is uniting Malawians, saying, let's come together. Let, we can agree on things, but let us agree. And after that, we are still Malawians. It doesn't make you less Malawi because you disagree with what the president has said. What is needed of a leader is to listen. And when he listens, he acts on it. But if he just listens and hears it and just goes to bed and comes back the next day, it's business as usual. It's as if he hasn't even heard you speak. That is insulting, you know, to Malawians. And we have seen this president hearing people listening to them, the next day, it's as if the people have not even spoken. And that, that's this is what Malawians are angry about because the president has been like an absentee president. He's there, he's hearing you, but he's not paying attention to what you're saying. The, you know, the empathy, the compassion has not been there in this leader. And this is what is there in Dr. Chakwera. He's empathetic, he's uh, compassionate, he's sympathetic of the people, and he is going to deliver because, and it's, you know, it's incumbent upon him, and he, he, will, he will succeed because he's made even the, uh, his vice president is going to be the minister of finance. That's an important thing because the 25 years, all the presidents in democratic Malawi have not used their vice presidents. By the time five years are over, they and their vice president are in disarray. They're not talking to each other. They cannot even be in the same room. What kind of leadership is that? Jeanette, uh, if I heard you uh, correctly, would it be accurate to say that uh, the 
the incumbent government views Malawi in the context of what is yours is ours, but what is mine is mine. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's, uh, you know, in fact, uh, what is yours, we're going to take and we're going to divide it amongst ourselves and we will throw you muscles as and when we feel, you know, we feel comfortable to do so. We don't feel comfortable to do so. We won't do it. In COVID-19, they said they were going to give every Malawian that is a poor person, they were going to give them, I, I think they mentioned 40,000 uh, kwacha. I haven't heard anything like that happening. What I heard was um, uh, Muli, one of the ministers in, in the DPP, Muli and Atuperi, going to the northern region to give Malawians some money. And, the, you know, the Malawians, there, they chased them out of there. And they told them, to get out of here, we don't want your money. And this, this is the corruption that I'm talking about. How do you give people money and how do you account for it? Where did it come from? Why are you giving the people this money? Interesting. It's Interesting. just for them to, you know, so that you vote for them. And, and it's not, you know, if they were go there was going to be a money-giving ceremony, a handout, there should be some formality, there should be some openness. So there has been no openness, no transparency. It's just people coming in with bags of money, and as you give the money to them and say, okay, I'm giving you this money, and it, some of them have been giving out monies and then taking away their voter registration certificates. That's corruption right then and there. In this period, since February, February 3rd, 2020, people have been going around in the villages saying, I'm going to give you a loan, give me your uh, voter certificate. So there are some people in the country that don't have their voter certificate, re registration certificates, because it's been taken away from them by unscrupulous people that are in this government right now. Elderson, what about you? Uh, could you please uh, respond to the same question? What makes Dr. Chakwera tick? What would you say is his vision, if we have to talk about the vision thing? What is his vision for Malawi, in your view? Dr. Lazarus Chakwera for the Malawi Congress Party is coming on the political scene with uh, his experience as a leader of the church. He has been a leader of the church and in the religious circles is highly uh, regarded as somebody who is very prominent. Um, he's coming out of the uh, religious uh, background with no dents, if I were to use that. At the same time, he's somebody who has an experience of the past regime, the Kamuzu Banda regime. And I'm sure he knows what Malawian, Malawians want. In this regard, I'm looking at what he has promised Malawians, that he will reduce the, the, the price of the fertilizer. Uh, because Malawi is, a, is, a, is, a, is an agriculture-based economy. So if you are giving people kind of like free fertilizer, you are assured of a bumper yield. And the people who are food, they are assured of you know, hard work. They can work hard in their respective places. And in the long run, you have healthy people. And Malawi can grow only if they have got, we have got healthy people. So he is coming on the political scene with promising of food, which is very paramount. Mm -hmm. And if that is achieved, I'm sure you'll be a darling to many. At the same time, you are looking at a president who has paired with somebody with experience from government, somebody who has been the vice president in the current regime. So he also, as a young man, is coming on the political scene knowing that Malawi is a democracy that has gone into phases. But now if it's run like business, as a corporate entity, because it's coming from the corporate world, I'm sure he will also devise mechanisms and strategies that will see Malawi progress better and quicker to fix the lost time. Talking about uh, President uh, Professor Peter Mutarika, what would you say, for example, that was his single most important decision during his presidency? And what about uh, his single most regrettable decision, in your view, under the same period? One, I would say, in his regime, he has respected the freedom of the press. We are able to write, we are able to report, we are able to publish critically or critiquing his government. And we have seen changes happening because the reporter or journalists are able to provide some checks and balances. If things are going wrong with government, we have reported 
and uh, things have been verified, investigated, and we have been spared. That alone has been a plus for him. He has also tried to put in place structures for the technical colleges where skills for young, young people in the rural setting and elsewhere would go and at least gain some technical skills. And uh, that's a big plus for him. However, I'm looking at these structures as structures, but there is need to have the, the manpower, to have technical, te te technical people in place, uh, enough, enough resources to make sure that these things run. However, um, I'm also looking at him as somebody who has been receiving a lot of information, but maybe making instant and the speedy kind of you know, decisions has been some of his um, shortcomings. To what extent uh, would you say, Erickson, that uh, the coronavirus pandemic has affected Malawian politics? And here I am talking about uh, campaigning for the upcoming elections. And to what extent also do you think the coronavirus is likely to affect or influence the outcome in as far as the upcoming elections is concerned? Shaka, how the whole world is scared of coronavirus or COVID-19, Malawi is as well concerned and we are as well threatened because we have already lost four people and close to 100 now that have been diagnosed to be positive of coronavirus. However, Malawians in my own view as a reporter, as a journalist, they are dealing with a long-standing political problem. COVID has come in the midst of the problem that has actually put Malawians to a corner. So COVID-19, yes, we have, and people are dying. But what is seen on the ground, Shada, is something different. We're kind of like living in a different planet altogether. Because as the campaign is going on, as the days are, as, as we're counting down the day of, of the post, many people are thronging the rallies, both for the opposition and the ruling. No social distance is there, Shaka. No people are putting on masks to avoid or prevent the COVID-19. People are, their mindset is tuned to let me have the president. Let me go to the polls first. Let me deal with this political problem. Then I can go to the COVID-19 and treat it accordingly. Janet, uh, what about you? Uh, what is uh, your uh, response, for example, to... The question that I asked uh, Edison earlier about uh, how, for example, the coronavirus pandemic has affected Malawians during this campaigning, and uh, how do you expect the same virus to affect Malawians during the upcoming election? It is a very sad thing that we have the coronavirus at a time when we have this other urgent and pressing matter, that of electing a new president. And to Malawians, you know, um, we used to have a song in the old days with Kamuzu Banda, Zibu Titani Ipea Malawi, Tinibambu Yaba Kamuzu. Come what may, we are behind Kamuzu. Come what may, coronavirus or no coronavirus, we are going to go for an election. We want to have a new leader. And that is what Malawians are resolute about right now. Uh, they're not social distancing. They're excited about getting a new president. On that note, uh, our guests were Erdson Chagala and Janet Karim. Get better, not bitter, Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive.